So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Pulowski. I will be your host today uh, in our webinar, uh, Selective Spray Conformal Coating, Optimizing for Maximum uh, Output. So the idea here, what we're gonna be talking about is how to optimize your process because you're not in the business of just coating boards, you're in the business of making money, hopefully coating boards. So uh, we're gonna help you maximize that. So uh, first, uh, quick introductions. Like I said, I'm Kevin Pulowski. Uh, I'm a marketing manager, uh, application specialist over at Chemtronics. Um, good person to know if you uh, have any questions and you call in, there's a good chance you'll get me on the phone. Um, if you uh, do a, on our website, uh, you go chat, you're gonna chances are you're gonna get me and I can generally answer a whole lot of questions. I've been at this about 18 years. So uh, I can offer a lot, but I'm not a chemist. But luckily, we do have chemists on staff. So speaking of which, we have Pierce Pallon. Uh, Pierce is a, uh, is a senior uh, field engineer at ITW. Uh, and he's, uh, he's formulated a lot of these coatings. Uh, but also, he's our field engineer. So he's out there uh, trying to make things work right for you. So if there's any problems, he's the one that jumps on an airplane and gets over to you. And he's been in the industry about 18 years as well and has been very active at IPC, uh, SMTA, uh, and just out there. Also, you may have seen him at uh, any of these events uh, speaking. And uh, so on the screen there, you'll see his email, his phone number, and of course, uh, a special guest, John Urquhart with PVA. Now, uh, Pierce covers uh, the chemistry side. John's covering the equipment side. So between the two of them, we've got it all covered, okay? And so that's the whole point of this is get the experts together and let's talk about how to make your process work as good as it can get. Uh, John's the director of global applications engineering. Uh, and so similar to Pierce, he's the one, uh, he's one of the people that are there to help you get your job done, okay? If you're running into any spray problems, if you're trying to spec in some new equipment, uh, there's a good chance you're going to talk to John as well. Let's just go over a quick conformal overview um, and what conformal coatings do and do not do, uh, and a little bit of the chemistries. And then John will obviously um, work on the equipment side, and we're going to kind of tag team back and forth through this presentation. So just a little bit about just conformal coatings in general. Um, when our laboratory team or any of the, the other coating manufacturers create these coatings, they're designed to protect your PCBAs and your assemblies uh, from any environmental exposure in their service areas. And just basic typical characteristics of any conformal coating, it will conform to the contours of the board. It will get in all the nooks and crannies where it needs to go. Um, it will coat very evenly and it goes in between the gaps between the components uh, if, if the settings are correct and you've chosen the correct chemistry. Uh, they're very lightweight, they're very flexible, and for the most part, they are humidity and temperature resistant. They are not waterproof. So let's bear that in mind. So why do you want to coat? Well, first and foremost, it will increase the reliability and the workings of your PCBA and your final assembly in the service environment. Well, how does it do this? Okay, well, it, um, it'll provide protection from any environmental and physical contaminants, whether it's gaseous, whether it's chemical splashes, whether it's UV invasion, uh, FOD, just about anything that you can think of if you've chosen the right coating. Um, it will prevent any kind of current leakage uh, that may be going on if you get moisture invasion. Uh, it insulates any heat sensitive, moisture sensitive components to a degree. Uh, it prevents arcing if you get moisture invasion uh, under the coating. It will help to, to prevent that. So let's go over a couple of the of the application methods. And the first is, is obviously a manual method. Um, it's usually a lot of times for very small areas for touch up, for prototyping. Um, there are a lot of, there's some pros and a lot of cons to brushing. 
um, it's totally uh, reliant on the operator for consistency. Every operator will, will brush a little bit differently. Even one operator will brush one board one way and another board slightly different. There's always, always a risk of contamination from handling the assembly or if your tools are not clean, if there's a breeze coming from air registers, whatever, there's always that, that potential for having FOD land on that coating. Uh, there's obviously increased housekeeping with it. You'd have exposure uh, to the operators from the chemicals that you're using from the solvents and the coatings. When you do brush, we always recommend using natural hair bristle brushes, nothing synthetic because some of the cheaper brushes will dissolve in the coatings. So be very careful about that. If you have some drying of the coating on the brush, if the operator gets up and takes a break and doesn't put it back into a, a solvent cup, um, it could uh, accumulate on that brush and then deposit on the board. Grosser the, the bristles are, the bigger the bristles are, those can entrain air as you're dipping in, as you're wiping off, it can entrain air between those bristles. And then when you make your pass across the board, it will deposit those bubbles on that substrate. Sometimes they'll come out, sometimes they won't. Uh, brush direction can be very, very important uh, relative to the coverage that you're getting in a specific area or, or on a specific component. And generally these are used, as I mentioned before, for prototyping, for touch-upping, if you're r and r or removing and replacing a component, you'll you know, take the component off, you'll clean the area again where you re-solder on, and then you can just touch up with a brush. So that's, uh, that's brushing. If you're dipping, this can be done obviously manually. They do have automatic systems where you can dip. It's pretty much a robotic system. There's a large bath for the coating. And on the larger systems, the more automatic systems, those can, those can have a nitrogen blanket on there that can prevent it from uh, drying out and um, where you, you have a lot of viscosity issues from start to finish over a project or over a shift. Uh, you do need to monitor that, monitor that withdrawal speed. And the reason being is that your withdrawal speed is the only thing that's going to uh, determine your wet film thickness. Contrary to what you may think, the slower you withdraw it, the less wet film you have, and the faster you withdraw it, the more wet film thickness you'll end up with. Uh, it does comply or complete, provide complete coverage of the board, you just have to have that residence time in the coating to allow that to go everywhere it needs to go. Uh, it can be anywhere from a low volume to a high volume, depending on if you're doing this manually or it's an automatic system. And it's generally an offline process. In other words, it's not conveyorized over to this. They take it from solder to cleaning to the uh, dip coating process areas. One of the uh, I guess we'll say final and, and most common methods to manually apply performal coatings is the spray method. And by spray, I'm referring to manual spray using uh, either an aerosol can or a hand spray gun. Uh, when you're doing that, your boards will need to be masked for any areas that don't require coating. Uh, and the masking will also need to be removed after cure. Uh, the process will, will need to be performed inside of a, a spray booth or a ventilated booth of some sort, usually with filters, uh, so that you're taking any overspray or vapors um, from any solvents away from the operator. <clears throat> and, you know, like uh, any other manual method, uh, you know, the work area has got to be kept clean. Uh, you know, there's also, um, you know, a lot of risk for, um, uh, you know, contamination from dust and you know, dirty tools and all that. So, you know, housekeeping is key. And, you know, while manual spraying is, is quite an effective method, uh, there's a lot of handling uh, with, you know, masking, demasking. 
And, uh, you know, the consistency of the finish and the thickness, uh, you know, still relies heavily on the operator. So now we get into a selective process. So when you're, when you're applying formal coating selectively, um, you know, you're applying the coating in a specific pattern using a robot on a board, uh, typically using one or more types of applicators, and it's applied in a single wet layer that uh, will dry to your target thickness. Um, don't typically use multiple layers to apply selectively, but uh, it's I've seen it done in some special situations. Uh, with uh, selective systems, you, know, you do get the benefit of optimized coating usage uh, due to no overspray. You know, essentially, you're, you're programming exactly where you want the coating to go. You're not necessarily spraying off the sides of the board. Uh, you're also getting a very repeatable and usually improved process compared to uh, you know, your manual methods. And it's also a safer and much cleaner process for your operators. So um, if you've got a product that you're planning to, you know, start coding selectively, uh, here's a kind of a question I get asked a few times a year is how would I design a board? How would I lay it out for selective coding? Uh, if you do have the luxury of working with a, a product designer and you can talk about, you know, designing for manufacture, um, you know, here's, here's, you know, a, kind of a short list of, of guidelines to use for uh, layout to just help uh, enable a, a selective coding process uh, and, and allowing it to be successful. Um, you know, some of the key points, you know, you want to allow, you know, two to three millimeters uh, would be great around no coat zones or keep out areas. This just allows any variation in coding flow. Uh, it's good to group any of your tall components together. But with that being said, you also want to leave enough access so your applicators can get around any large components or if they got to get coating underneath tall components. Uh, you want to play, place connectors away from your coated areas if possible. Uh, you know, like anything, just give yourself enough room uh, between the, the must coat and no coat areas. Um, any connectors being used, uh, it's always good to use a, a, a type of connector that has a sealed lead or it's got a sealed socket. Just this just prevents coating from wicking inside should you have to coat around the base of the connector or connector leads. Uh, it's always good to plug unused vias, that way you prevent coating from seeping through or wicking through to the other side of the board. Um, you know, you wanna leave uh, enough edge clearance on the board, typically five millimeters is uh, SMEMA spec uh, to allow for, you know, smooth conveyor transport. And then, um, you know, you, you want to clearly define uh, what you what must be coded and what must not be coded. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to uh, inspection, you know, make sure you understand the limitations of the process. In other words, you know, what thicknesses can and can't be achieved, what sort of coverage can and can't be achieved, and, and how does it look? You know, be sure to, to uh, make sure your QC people understand that. You know, when you're planning for automation, um, you know, there's a few things to consider uh, based on your board design. Um, this helps determine, you know, how large of a coding machine do you need? Uh, does it have the proper clearances to allow the boards to transfer properly? Um, how will the products be handled? Will they be handled manually? Do they need to be in a carrier or a pallet of some sort? Uh, will they be transferred on a shuttle uh, or conveyor? Uh, and also what type of application method will be used? You know, can a product be fully selectively coded or do any areas require you know, a, a tape dot or a masking dot applied. Um, you know, and also you know, do the applicators require special clearances or extra reach around tall components? Does the coding system have enough axes of motion to complete the task? You know, in other words, can you do it with a simple three axis machine or do you need a four or five axis machine to access all areas of the, uh, the board? And, uh, you know, how, how will the product be cured? You know, this will lead to how you set up your curing. And we'll talk about this briefly a bit later. This is one item I, I like to always comment on if I'm talking to somebody about, you know, setting up a new process is, you know, make sure your documentation clearly outlines, you know, what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to coat. Uh, and this example that I just, you know, threw together from just a random concept, um, you know, if you see the image on the left, obviously we get a lot of drawings in black and white and you see a lot of different types of crosshatch and, and X's and everything else. Um, and it's kind of tough to determine what you must and must not coat. So if you take a look, 
you know, uh, can you can you find nine keep out areas easily in that whole drawing? Um, you know, it's not always that easy. Uh, if you can do something like the image on the right, you know, and I might be easier said than done, but just adding a little bit of color makes a huge difference. Um, you know, you want to uh, lay out three different types of callouts for coverage. Uh, in the green, you've got where the coating is absolutely required. In the white areas, the coating is uh, optional. And the red areas show uh, where you absolutely must not have any coating. So this helps minimize you know, any questions or issues in determining you know, what is a properly coated board. Um, and you know, one additional thing in this sort of layout is the image on the right could actually come in handy uh, if you're trying to set up an AOI system. So you, know, you, can, you can clearly define uh, what regions the, the cameras need to be looking for. I have a, I have a quick question. Um, so I'm seeing this coding optional area. So it looks like uh, on the image to the right, you're building in some tolerance also into the, uh, the keep out area. Yep. So yeah, uh, that kind of goes along with the idea I had mentioned earlier about, you know, if you can, you know, design uh, or, or have input into layout of a board, you know, can you have two to three millimeters for, you know, uh, clearance from your must coat and your no coat areas? Again, that's just to allow, you know, variations in coating flow should they come up. Okay. Now I have one more question. Now I don't want to get us too far off track, but uh, you've mentioned um, axes, um, machines that have three uh, axis points or four to five. Now um, I, I know length width depth, but what's what are we talking about with uh, axis points once you get to four to five? So you know when you're getting beyond three, you've got X, Y, and Z. You know left, right, front, back, and, and up, down, vertical. But then you've got rotational. So you might be spinning axially about the z-axis, and then the fifth, you know, fourth or fifth, uh, could have a servo or a pneumatic tilt. So now you've got uh, the ability to coat the sides of components, underneath components, you know, just get into hard-to-reach areas that just the vertical type approach can't get to. All right, when it comes to processing uh, liquid coatings, you know, machine providers typically, you know, group them into you know two different categories. Uh, you know, we'll say you've got either solvent-based or 100% solids product. Uh, this helps us guide the choice of what sort of applicator or group of applicators to use. Uh, it helps define the processing method and, uh, you know, gives us an idea of how we're going to cure the product. For solvent-based coatings, you know, the typically you know, low viscosity, uh, typically under 100 centipoise, uh, often they require dilution for processing if they don't already if they're not provided already diluted, um, you know, during cure, uh, you're going to lose quite a bit of wet film thickness uh, just due to the solvent evaporation. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you can apply multiple layers of, of solvent based coatings, um, but typically you're, you're applying, a, again, selective, you're typically applying a single wet layer that, uh, that you know, the solvents evaporate off to get your thickness. Uh, and, you know, some typical examples you see in like uh, acrylics or solvent-based urethanes. Uh, the other category you'd say, you know, typically say are 100% solids coatings. Um, and these are, you know, products that have no solvent carrier in them. And they tend to be higher in viscosity, you know, up to, you know, uh, three, you know, 1,000 to 3,000 centipoise, in some cases even higher. Um, you know, because there's no additional solvent uh, required to process these, uh, there's very little or, or, or no loss of the film thickness uh, when they're cured. Uh, these coatings are almost always applied in a single layer, uh, and you know there's there's multiple curing options, uh, you know depending on the type of product. So, in other words, um, you know you might be curing with uh, just humidity or moisture in the air, uh, or you might be using strictly heat only, or you might be using a uh, UV cure uh, type of product. Um, now, you, you had mentioned 100% solids, but uh, Pierce, I, I think I heard you mention that uh, that's sort of a, can be a misnomer, can be a, sort of a marketing it, term from time it, to time. It can be. Um, some of the companies will say, and, and this is a lot of times generally for where you see or where we've seen it mostly uh, with silicones, is that they'll say that it's, it's 100% solids, yet 
as as the raw material, the raw polymer comes in the door, um, it it already has some some solvents in it, just to make the polymer flowable. So, you know, if you really want to call it 100% solids, they really shouldn't have anything in it. You know, as far as solids or uh, solvents go. So, so just something to, to bear in mind if, if the spec requires 100% solvents or um, there's further dilution involved, you know, and it may be best to know what's in that. And of course, that would should be on the SDS, right? Um, for the most part, the new GHS format leaves a lot to be desired, in my opinion. It, it, things that, that had to be listed on the old ANSI format. Uh, format are not required anymore now. So you may don't don't take it for granted that you're getting complete um, formulation information on that SDS. Okay, you so, really so when in doubt, contact a chemical supplier. Like Absolutely. Products. Okay, very good. Thank you. You know, when it comes time to setting up equipment, um, you know, and, and choosing the tools to use, you know, it helps to have a very basic understanding of you know, everything we just talked about. What's, you know, what's the coating? How are you trying to apply it? Where are you trying to apply the coating on the substrate? So on. Um, and this helps guide, you know, what the coating system needs in order to complete the task. Uh, again, you know, we mentioned coating machines can be simple three axis robots with a spray head fed from a pressure pot. Or you can have you know much more involved configurations using four and five axes of motion, multiple applicators, fluid monitoring, barcode reading, on and on and on. You know all these different tools, um, you know, uh, integrated into the system uh, help you know keep the process on track. Getting into some of the types of applicators, there's typically four types of applicators. So the first type and probably most common is an atomized spray applicator. Um, you know, atomized spray valves are pretty much the all-around option for applying liquid formal coatings. You know, you're using a low volume, low pressure uh, spray, which allows you to provide a selective pattern. You know, you're not using a high volume spray gun where you're getting this mist and cloud of material that goes everywhere. It's a very gentle, soft application of the fluids where it needs to be. You know, selective uh, atomizing can be used for, for fully selective applications or even, you know, mask and spray, you know, automating a mask and spray type process. Um, you know, if you're using a solvent-based coating, just be sure the coating is diluted to the proper uh, ratio uh, or use a, a slow evaporating solvent, and that helps keep the spray heads clean and keeps them from drying too quickly. Uh, atomizing is also typically a choice for achieving the lowest film thicknesses uh, that are required uh, for a lot of coating operations. Uh, you know, often you know, get as low as 25 to 50 micron films um, and even thinner with you know, highly solvented uh, compositions. Um, you know, there's, there's a choice of you know, fine, you know, narrow spray and wide spray patterns available. And you know, a combination of head sizes or types you know, can be configured to fit uh, the process. Um, and applicator speeds are, are typically in the you know 100 to 200, four, you know, sorry, 100 to 200 millimeter uh, per second range. You know, four to, um, we'll say four to, to six or four to eight inches per second rate. The second type of applicator is an airless spray uh, valve. Uh, oftentimes, you know, refer to this as a film. A film coating valve, a curtain coating valve, a flow coating valve, um, and this type of valve, uh, you know, relies on the viscosity rheology of the coating to create a solid fan or a film pattern, which lays down a you know a very defined stripe of the coating uh, onto the substrate. Uh, this type of applicator works really best with solvent-based coatings. Uh, kind of the sweet spot is around 50 to 65 centipoise, but usually you know anything under 100 centipoise can be run. Uh, there's other tools that can be used to, to help uh, higher viscosity products work with this, but you typically want a very, very low viscosity coating to apply in here. Um, you know, the applicator speeds are much higher. You're in the 350 to 500 millimeter per second range. So you're anywhere from, I think you're about you know, 14, 12 to 14 uh, inches up to 18 inches a second range. Um, but, you know, be aware, you know, even though it is fast, um, because of the high speed, you've got a risk of possible splashing 
uh, from the coating bouncing off uh, certain component geometries. Uh, if you do find something like this happens, uh, often you can prevent this by maybe shifting the path slightly in your program or even just try changing the direction of the coding path. The uh, third uh, common applicator used with selective heads uh, or selective process are needle dispense valves. And these typically uh, are, are very commonly used to complement you know, the work that a spray valve might do. Uh, and you know, the needle valves are used to typically apply coating around or under uh, tall components. Uh, you can use it to draw an outline around a coating area. Uh, or you're applying a line or a dot of coating onto a component uh, or component leads for maybe some extra coverage. Or sometimes to get into hard to reach areas between tall components. Uh, in, in cases where the coating requirements uh, or the product design doesn't exactly allow a fully selective process, uh, a lot of times needle valves are used to apply a liquid peelable mask uh, in select areas uh, before coating. Hey, I've uh, got a question on the liquid peelable mask. If you're applying it with a needle, is there a sweet spot uh, for uh, viscosity or something like that? Um, I've seen it, you know, anything as low as 10,000 up to, we'll say, 30, 40,000. Uh, obviously, and, and this is just saying if you're applying from just a reservoir, um, you know, using air pressure, uh, needle, you know, the needle valves can apply much higher viscosity products, but then you'd have to use a pump of some sort to move it. So anywhere in the 10 to 40,000 centipoids, you can do higher viscosities if maybe they're fixotropic, but uh, that's usually the, the sweet spot. Yeah, and, and one caution that uh, we've run into on the, on the Chemtronic side is uh, the, the uh, shear curing that can occur with some masks. So they're... Um, there's especially in the natural latex is what a shear cure is is under pressure like if you have some in your finger and you squeeze it it actually cures uh, as you do that and of course the the pressures get pretty high as you get to the end of that needle uh, so it could uh, run into problems there so as you're if you're specking a mask or a process like that and you know you could be plugging up on you well just thinning it down may not do it uh, you need to take a look at that so here's a, just a kind of an application tip. Um, you know, uh, if you're using a needle valve, uh, you know, if you've got a maybe a high viscosity version or a gel version of uh, your, your coating, um, use the needle valve to draw a dam next to a keep out uh, or around a connector, you know, prior to your spraying. Um, I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, using a certain connector design to prevent wicking. Uh, but, you know, if you're a contract coating house or contract manufacturer, and you've got to use what you're given and you've got unsealed components or unsealed connectors. Uh, it's always good to be able to use something that's got high enough viscosity. You can apply it around the connector prior to using your low viscosity coating and it prevents anything from going inside. Uh, you know, typically we'll see this with a lot of service mount type uh, or through hole type connectors. Um, you know, uh, besides connectors, um, yeah, a lot of times we'll see uh, using something like that for plugging open vias, again, to prevent coating from wicking through to the uh, other side of the board. And then the, uh, the fourth kind of common applicator uh, used in selective applicate and selective machines uh, is the micro or the jet spence valve. Uh, you know, these types of valves, they apply a very small amount of coating, uh, either in a dot or a line or some very defined pattern. Uh, often, you know, around keep outs or even coating individual components. You know, these types of valves uh, are what we'd call a non-contact type applicator. And, you know, you're not necessarily spraying the coating, but you're just kind of letting dots or streams of liquid uh, exit the nozzle as it sits above the uh, circuit board. The, uh, the main benefit of using a jet, um, you know, is, is being able to really precisely deposit coating in very small amounts uh, you know, from a distance of some cases, you know, up to almost half an inch away from the substrate. Uh, depending on the substrate size, so you've got something very small, uh, you know, a jet or micro valve alone might be all that's needed. Um, you know, an example of this would be like on flex circuits, uh, micro PCBs uh, used in mobile devices or, um, you know, medical uh, products. 
um, you know, something to note is to be careful of the, the coating thickness that you end up applying using this sort of method. Uh, while jetting provides a very defined XY placement of the coating, uh, if the coating viscosity is too high or the thickness applied is, is too great, you know, it might not lay down and create as thin a film as if it was sprayed. Uh, so, you know, this could lead to, you know, potentially future cracking issues when it's under stress uh, in the coating or, you know, possible assembly problems with, uh, you know, intricate and, and uh, small tolerance uh, designs. When you're feeding uh, the coating systems, you know, you know, often a simple pressure pot will, uh, will work. You know, you're just putting air on a tank, send this material out to your applicators, and then uh, things are great. But um, that doesn't always work for everybody. Uh, sometimes people want a more hands-off approach. Uh, maybe it's got issues with pressure fluctuations in, in the factory, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's, there's feed systems uh, available, uh, often, you know, using gear pumps or similar types of pumps. Um, which can provide coating, uh, you know, right out to the applicator. In some cases, you know, in this example here, uh, we use a solvent-based coating uh, with airless applicators uh, where we'll actually circulate it out to the valve. We'll run it through a heater. Uh, you've got warm coating at the valve, and then it recirculates back uh, through the system and continuously pumps through. So you, you do two things here. You you raise the temperature of the coating so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, consistent. You uh, also provide a much consistent thickness because the viscosity is not changing. Um, and because you're using the pump to move the coating, uh, it minimizes the risk of getting bubbles inside your tank because you use, you, at that point, you need a very low amount of air pressure uh, on the tank itself. You're just letting the pump move the coating and not the uh, air pressure on the tank. And another device um, that's used, uh, and this is something we call uh, continuous film calibration. This is often used with your airless applicators. And it's a, a measuring device used to calibrate the spray pattern uh, as it exits the valve. And you know, while it's measuring it, it also is tied to the control system to adjust the pattern, uh, the, the spray pattern with, uh, to compensate for any variations typically seen with viscosity fluctuation. Um, using this type of device, uh, you know, it's very fast. It only takes, you know, a few seconds, two to four seconds to, to take that reading. Uh, and while it, it uh, you know, it not only measures the film width, but it also measures and verifies, well, it doesn't measure, but it verifies that the film is actually continuous across the entire spray pattern. Uh, so this ensures that there's no breaks and that the, the stripe that you're putting out is consistent. Okay, so you're going to be preparing the chemistry um, so you have everything set up and it's ready for the delivery system. Well, the first thing that you're going to have to do is transfer the coating fluid from the packaging container into your pressure vessel. Well, first and foremost, always use clean containers, clean tools, just to reiterate what John has, has tried to hammer in on the, uh, the housekeeping. Um, one way to prevent a lot of cleaning on the pressure vessel is to use liners in there. Those liners are disposable. Once it's empty, if you're either adding material, you can change out the old liner, put in the new liner, add, add materials. Works very well if you're switching from one coating to another um, as well as having to clean your lines and, and your applicators. Uh, you do want to work in a well-ventilated area uh, because those solvents are just raw at that point. So you need to protect your operators. Um, <laughs> as you can see from the picture, uh, and, and maybe that's just the way the picture was taken or, or designed, but the pressure vessel is tilted and then you're Someone's pouring in from the uh, packaging format there. Uh, you want to pour in very gently to minimize the turbulence because that just creates a lot of bubbles. And then you've got to sit there and wait for the bubbles to, to uh, come to the surface and, and go away. Um, think about pouring a beer into a glass. to pour it down sideways and not, um, not create a head or, or any turbulence to the liquid at the bottom. If you need to dilute, 
stir it in, don't shake the, the vessel, um, mix it till you get to the desired viscosity. Uh, you can check using uh, various uh, viscosity cups. There's Ford, there's Zahn. Uh, it's based on a time on how long it takes to drip out the orifice on the cup. Um, when you do this, please make sure that you clean the cup thoroughly, including the orifice, because it can it can affect one or two seconds uh, on your on your answer. Uh, like I said, <clears throat> if you do have some air and train in here, let the bubbles come out naturally and never, ever, ever pull vacuum with a, a solvent borne coating in your in your pressure vessel or just even even if it's just a holding vessel. Because all that's going to do is force the coating to start curing out inside your vessel. Hey, uh, I got a question for you, Pierce. Um, mm -hmm. Just just cover maybe a misunderstanding out there. You know, let's say you've got you know you you clean, but you don't clean that well. There may be little pieces of coating. Uh, won't that just dissolve in? You know, it's the solvent, the same solvent dissolved it, in the first place. Won't it just dissolve well, again? It can. Uh, some solvents really are very chemically resistant. Uh, once in solution, they kind of tend to stay in solution, but then you got to work pretty hard to get them back into solution to dissolve. Uh, epoxies, um, urethanes are, are very common for this. So chances are it's just going to sit there, the piece. It's just going to sit there and it could, it could, it could foul some of your lines, mm -hmm. you know, which just messes up your delivery system. Okay, some little tips and hints if you're diluting. Well, if you've got an old time operator or old time engineer, you're gonna hear this somewhere down the line. We've always diluted because, well, because in years past, most of the bolt coatings that were on the market were considerably high solids. And the delivery system for the applicators at the time really couldn't, uh, didn't have a wide operating range. They had to get it down to a, a nominal level before they could consistently and repeatedly deliver these, these coatings. So they had to dilute. But nowadays, the nozzles and the delivery systems are much more advanced. They, can, they have a wider operating window. But also check with your coating manufacturer because what 10 years ago they may have offered in only uh, one viscosity option, they'll have the same product, but they, they uh, a lot of times will offer it in a high or a medium or a low viscosity uh, option, depending on what your needs are. So as I said, the newer nozzles or applicators, they, they can also handle very low viscosities now, like down to 10 centipoise, where in the past, it, it would almost pour out of the applicators. They really couldn't contain it very well. But as John can, can attest, there's been a lot of advances in the engineering on these, on these nozzles or applicators. Now, bear in mind that when you dilute, it will increase your overall cost. The, the diluent or your diluting agent may be very inexpensive, but it's going to cost you time. Okay, um, Your coating will go further because you've diluted it. But what you have done is you've decreased your viscosity, but in the meantime, you've just, you've also decreased your percent solids in that mixture. So your film build will be not as as great as it was. Uh, basically, your your price per board will go down, but your total cost for the manufacturing goes up. Um, and by diluting, it will increase the ability for the coating to flow by lowering that viscosity. But if you go a little too low, then you're gonna, it's just gonna start wicking or flowing into your keep out areas. Uh, whereas before you were able to keep it within the parameters of your drawings. So be very careful when you delete. Okay, curing methods. The Cheapest, most inexpensive way is to cure it at ambient conditions. Okay, it's slow. It's uh, the curing rate or, or the speed at which it cures. It's going to be dependent on your coating thickness, your wet film thickness, as well as the temperature in that facility or curing area, as well as the humidity. Okay, 
is generally okay for solvent-based and moisture uh, curing uh, coatings like RTVs. Uh, we recommend always using an enclosed cabinet rather than just racking them there because some coatings, if you're gonna rack them vertically, which you almost have to do, uh, some coatings have a tendency to slump a little bit and you could find them after cure in some keep out areas where they weren't there when you coated it. Um, but an enclosed cabinet, you're laying them down horizontally just the same way that they were, they were coated. Um, you wanna use an exhaust in there to limit your operator exposure, obviously, but it also limits um, depositing FOD on that fresh coating. You know, whether it's lint, fuzz in the air, stuff coming through your, your ventilation system or your air conditioning registers. So <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pluses to doing uh, ambient cure. Uh, the big pro or the big con is that it's extremely slow. So, you know, when you want to accelerate the cure uh, of, uh, again, usually solvent-based coatings, you can do this with uh, heat cure and, and, you know, some RTV type coatings. But, you know, typically when you've got a solvent-based coating, you want to accelerate it. Um, you know, we typically uh, use IR ovens um, as you know, the, the energy from, from the IR infrared uh, is a really good choice as, you know, it's warming the substrate from the inside out. So, you know, someone may say, well, I've got an old convection oven, I'm going to use that. Well, it will work. It can be done. I've seen people do it. But, you know, you've got to be careful to use a very gentle ramp to your cure temp to avoid, uh, you know, skinning the board or skinning the coating too fast on the board, which can potentially, you know, trap some solvents uh, still trying to come out. And that ends up leading to air bubbles uh, in the finish. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, a selective process, again, you know, the ovens used are typically conveyorized. There's, there's a, a range of links depending, you know, lengths of the oven, depending on the production rate and the amount of cure required. Uh, and, you know, most often, you know, for an inline process, uh, most often you want the coating to be tack free. You know, you're not necessarily baking it, uh, but you're getting it tack free and it's solid so that, uh, if you know the board can be handled for any next steps in the assembly or testing process, and you know if uh, someone is handling the substrate, then you don't get drips falling off the board or you don't get fingerprints, uh, and it helps us minimize you know any any um, contaminants getting to the substrate at that point. Uh, and then it, you know it's always good to to run profiles uh, you know using. Uh, you know, your production, a production substrate in order to get a very accurate reading of how the board uh, is heating up. And then just uh, a couple, you know, example profiles, um, you know, showing the difference between using, you know, something that does have solvent, a coating that does have a solvent uh, versus something that's strictly a heat cure product. You know, in this case, the heat cure product was 100% solid silicone. Um, if you notice the image on the left, you've got a much more gradual slope uh, up to temperature. And again, this is to avoid, you know, a skinning over of the coating or, or trapping of the solvents. Um, you know, you want to allow the solvents time to generally uh, exit out of the coating uh, as the cross linking, linking starts to happen. Um, and the image on the right, you know, as I mentioned, uh, with silicone, uh, you know, it shows a very fast ramp to temp. Uh, but, you know, too much can also be a bad thing. You know, again, too hot, too fast. Uh, you still could generate bubbles, you know, maybe appearing around leads or underneath components because you're trying to just, you're just trying to hit it or shock it too fast. And any, any air pockets are just trying to get out, um, you know, creating, leading to a bubble situation. So, you know, if you do see something like that where, where bubbles are, are generated, uh, you know, immediately after or during the cure cycle, uh, you know, lower your ramp rate uh, if necessary. And then lastly, you know, another uh, curing method, and this is, you know, wholly dependent on the type of coating you're using. And, you know, if you're using an uh, ultraviolet cure coating, um, you know, you want to determine, uh, you, do you need a, a spot cure? Do you need a flood? Uh, are you using a focused cure? Do you need a focused beam? Or, you know, you're just trying to cure an entire substrate. Um, you know, again, with selective systems, these are all inline conveyorized ovens. 
Uh, you want to make sure the light can get all, you know, to all the necessary coded areas to at least start the cross-linking process. Uh, if there are shadowed areas on your board, where nine times out of 10, there usually is, uh, you know, you want to check to make sure your coating has some sort of secondary cure mechanism, whether it's, uh, you know, a heat cure, secondary or moisture exposure, uh, which will help provide, you know, complete cure in your shadowed areas over time. Uh, you, you know, just check with your coating supplier to uh, understand you know, when the coating will actually reach full properties before you do any uh, stress testing. And like with any oven, you know, use the proper calibration tools, in this case, a radiometer, uh, periodically to just ensure that the oven is uh, providing proper output. Then, you know, lastly, you know, once you've got all your pieces in place, you know, here's one example of an inline, you know, medium to high rate uh, process to coat both sides of the substrate, you know, including a flipper, uh, a couple of queue stations, uh, AOI for inspection, uh, inspection queue, and, and um, for an entry level process, uh, you might only just need a single coating machine and a batch configuration may be all that you need uh, for very high volume production. Uh, features such as dual lane conveyors, multi-head tooling, uh, you know, uh, multiple applicators, you know, can be added for, and, and multiple machines uh, could be added for processing, you know, multiple boards at a time and just maximizing the throughput. Okay, so <clears throat> what can be some, or actually the main causes for coding defects? And this slide is actually pulled from our coding defects uh, webinar, which I believe Kevin has provided a link for. So I'm not going to go into really any detail, but um, Cleaning, application, and curing are the three main causes for coating defects, okay? Now, there are categories within each of those. Um, and I do want to point out that uh, there are some defects or process indicators uh, that can be, at, um, can be caused by more than one of these. For instance, voids and bubbles can be uh, caused by uh, miscuring, uh, it can also be caused by some of the application errors. So um, I urge you to, to review that, that webinar or the slides for the webinar. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of good information on there and defects if you weren't able to attend. So that's all I'm gonna say about that one. Cleaning your PCBA before you coat. Well, coatings love clean, okay? But some of these um, areas below uh, will resolve a lot of your coating issues, okay? If you clean your PCBA before uh, post solder, or actually post solder and uh, pre-coating. Uh, very common for a variety of, of causes uh, just because of FOD and other contaminants that are on the board, such as fish eyes, dewetting, delamination. These, these are very common, commonly seen in uncleaned or improperly cleaned assemblies, um, flux residues that are left on the board can absorb moisture. Uh, they can cause corrosion even underneath the coating. Uh, it's actually called a triangle. Um, so we always recommend that your, that your uh, assembly should be cleaned before the coating process. This includes no clean fluxes. Just a real quick note here. The way no cleans work is that doesn't, just because you don't have to clean them because of lack of dendritic growth doesn't mean that you shouldn't clean them prior to coating. Um, it depends on how good your cleaning process is. Um, but you can avoid these failures due to a lot of these surface contaminations, flux residues, uh, mold release agents on your components, um, silicone contamination, which can come from almost anywhere. So it's very migratory material. Uh, adhesive residues like from Capton, that's just a generic term, uh, scoring dust, any other fod that may come uh, and land on that board uh, before you coat. Okay, so the impact of cleaning. Well, the whole idea of cleaning, essentially, number one, you remove the residues, but you do that because coatings love clean and it has to be able to adhere to the surface of the substrate. Otherwise, you're not gonna get any functional protection. It's just gonna either lift off, peel off, delaminate, de-wet, 
and it's it's just not going to be a good process. So uh, a lot of the residues, fluxes, FOD, oils, greases, they all affect the ability of that coating to adhere to the substrate. And like I said, it could result in dewetting, could result in delamination. If it's a big, relatively big piece of FOD, uh, it just blocks the substrate from being coated. Um, and overall, you'll just get better integrity of that interface between the coating and the substrate, and it will allow that coating to protect the assembly the way it's designed to do by adhering to the substrate. All right, so, so I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Pierce. Uh, great job on that. You know, our job is to make your job easier, to make your process more effective and more efficient. Because uh, like, like I said, you know, you're not in the business of, of coding, you're in the business of making money uh, by coding. Uh, so, um, so, you know, our job is to help you do that. So please reach out to us if, if you need anything. And again, John uh, Pierce, great job. I, I appreciate uh, all your work. Here.